Okay, so <coughs> where we left off was at uh, content mapping. And <coughs> you can see here that um, content mapping is trying to decide how to uh, break the information into chunks of information. So into pieces where you would um, uh, group things together. So you, the questions you would ask are that um, these are the ones on page 314. Should this content be divided into smaller chunks? Um, what is the smallest section? And will the content need to be used multiple times? And <coughs> maybe different chunks are advisable for different types of access units. So um, also it shows on page, on, uh, page uh, 315. Uh, in 316 and 317, uh, figure uh, 1217 is on page 316 that shows a content mapping where you have a, a source um, information that's going to be associated with a certain web uh, site destination. And so this is how things are grouped. And then <coughs> you have on figure uh, 1218 on page 317, you have that the content mapping process will decide how the content is mapped to the site. So this, that is the information that was outlined in the content mapping table would relate to where you actually place the information on the website. So they have like uh, information that's 2.2.1, 2.2.3, and 2.2.2 is related to the information they took out of the content mapping table. So this is part of the content mapping process. And the goal of this process is that you can have <coughs> separation of the content from the container, which is what we talked about before, so that you can use information or content in different places on the website. And it doesn't have to be just associated with one place on the website. And the content model uh, that you come up with is sort of like a micro information architecture. And um, <coughs> this is the content model is the relationship between the chunks. Uh, micro information architecture made of small chunks of interconnected content that will help the, in the contextual navigation. And we experience content models on the web, like in a recipe or a clothing site, there's certain ways that you access content. <coughs> and then the content models depend on consistent steps of objects and logical connections between them to work. So we would expect a recipe has the ingredients at the top and then the steps that you take to put together the ingredients below that. And then should you identify, also you should also identify what is the point of entry of the site what metadata is needed to connect the chunks or the links. So <coughs> the idea of the content model, which is on pages 317 to 323, is how do you link the objects together? And, uh, and, the, and you usually do a gap analysis to help you identify uh, what content objects are missing from the site, and uh, what is the point of entry, what is the metadata that's needed to connect the chunks of information together? And what is the critical data and the critical metadata that's needed? And so there's, there's some uh, images that are examples of that. Um, and this... Um, uh, gap analysis uh, pr process is something that they actually sh kind of uh, show um, when they have uh, figures 1221 on page 320 and 1222 which is this is also <coughs> coming up so they use sort of a um, card sorting exercise so they ask, this is the, um, for an, the 
a content uh, model for an album information for an album website <coughs> and they do say identify what are the pages the major pages that they need and they ask the subjects where they want to go next among the content objects and they should draw lines that indicate the navigation between the objects so maybe you think there should be a connection from the album page to the artist bio or from the album page to the album descriptions or the album page to the album reviews and the gap analysis is to ask the subjects which missing content objects would be good to include so what you should include on the page and here <coughs> this answers some of the questions like what is the entry point on the page so you have what is the entry point it's here and here you could enter through the album pages and through the album descriptions and then what type of what is the critical data that's needed uh, for the customer well they identified they also would like a discography they would also like a TV listing and a concert calendar and then <coughs> what is the uh, connections between uh, the, the content objects so we see that you can go from album, album pages you need to be able to go to reviews and descriptions and maybe you need to go <coughs> both ways between discograph discography and album pages you need a bi-directional links and here's other connections between the album descriptions and artists at concerts <coughs> and then um, what kind of metadata is needed to connect between the chunks this is like maybe uh, this is the information about the content so if you have a artist bio uh, the artist bio would probably contain the artist's name for example that would be metadata about the artist and then it would also be um, maybe things like um, what uh, what the genre the artist is performing in uh, if the you know what is the uh, year or the, t the, t the years in which they're producing uh, their disc or their their music so you have to kind of decide what is the important metadata for this and um, <coughs> I just want to <coughs> Yeah, there's also uh, an example of the metadata on um, page 323. So they have like the uh, album page and it links to other content art objects by leveraging common metadata attributes like the album mm -hmm. name, the artist name, the label, and the release date. So this has um, the content object is the album page and it connects to other content objects like the album review, the discography and the album and the artist and then the metadata that you need to connect those two things would be the album name and the artist name for example <coughs> okay so this is um, yeah <coughs> I just wanted to point out that you can do this like if you're redesigning a page or if you are um, creating a new page you can do this type of approach so you can come up with what is the main information that they need to have and how do you see if they need to link between the pages so you do this card sort and then you also do this gap analysis and you could do this for example we, we could try it um, with two web pages One thing I wanted to point out too is that the content model can help you link between horizontally between uh, information in the, in the hierarchy so if you have for example 
you have information here and you want to link to information here, this is what Amazon does. <coughs> they might store information under one hierarchy, <coughs> like uh, books. <coughs> so maybe this is a book on, this is, maybe this is Harry Potter. <coughs> and this is the book number one. And they might say that in Amazon, the people that bought book number one also bought uh, this uh, Harry Potter figure or toy. <coughs> Even though this toy would be in a different part of the hierarchy than the book. So <coughs> what uh, content mapping and content models help you to do is link horizontally or across horizontal levels <coughs> of hierarchies. So it's an extra navigation aid. <coughs> and if we look, uh, we can compare two sites. Um, I'll go back to this example of, um, let's see. Okay, so this was again the old uh, uh, skateboard site, Skate Pro. <coughs> and uh, we could see, we can do sort of a exercise and find out what is some of the essential information that they present on this site. Um, I will just mark down some of these. Can I erase this? Are you done? Okay, well, anyway, we could say that some of the key content of the site would be things like information about the products, like the boards. So, this might be a thing. And then also, you might have things like um, reviews by customers. And you could have things like uh, information about gifts and sales. <coughs> you might also have information about clothing. Mm. And that that can be like protective clothing or just stylish. And then you might have things like parts. <coughs> so from a perspective of um, creating a content model, uh, you need to identify what would be the entry point for the site and maybe like uh, something about the products like this is the products like the boards would be an entry point and then you could uh, if you're the users you can decide like what type of connections need to be made between these different parts so we have um, we might have a on this page, we can look with, if we go to, we go to boards, for example. Uh, we have uh, connections. Here we have um, connections, and we might we also might have like, we have a main page, and this might have connections to boards, and the boards uh, might have I don't know if it has connections to reviews, but not yet. But anyway, maybe reviews maybe needs this, and has connections to this. There doesn't seem to be anything here here but if you went to the prior page um, 
there was like connections to um, clothing. Mm. Uh, so if you were in the main page, there was like a connection to clothing. And there was also, I think there was a connection to pot somewhere. Maybe there's not. So anyway, um, but if we compare this site with another site, <coughs> so this is another uh, skate skateboard site, skatewearhouse.com. And here they have a entry point where they have boards and that also has connection to parts and clothing and um, yeah. um, I don't know if they have anything about sales here. Mm. But one thing they have in the on the top is they have a connection to brands. And this is like something that may, didn't exist on the other page. So they have like a brands. And then the brands actually has it's like a two way link between brands and many of the other things like the boards. And also uh, the parts and the clothing. And because this brand is on their main menu, it's um, kind of a, a navigation aid that helps you to get between the two branches in the hierarchy. So this being in the in the global navigation on this page uh, helps you. Like if I went to Adidas, well, I get shoes and I get some clothing. But if I went to um, uh, let's see, like if I went to Element. I get boards, I get parts, and I get clothing. So it kind of acts as a connection between different vertical branches of the hierarchy. So this kind of goes across different zones or different regions. So this page is, um, you could say, that if, if you were to interview someone and tell them to write up a content model for the skate pro page and to write a content model for th for the this page uh, skateboard warehouse they would have two different content models and th there might be some connections that are supported between information chunks on this page that are not supported on this page and vice versa and you might say like what is it that uh, as a customer I would like to see connections between and then you would um, be able, to, this is sort of the gap analysis to identify how you would improve the network page. <coughs> okay, so in uh, number three assignment, 
you're asked to do blueprints and wireframes. So this gives you some idea of how your group can work together and also come up with uh, like a content model and perhaps a wireframe based on a gap analysis. Okay, the um, other design topics that they talk about are things like um, web-based prototypes. So these could be um, uh, digital representations of the uh, how the page is going to look. So it's like a wireframe also, but it's not just, it's not the wireframe, it's one step further. It's like a prototype for how the web page can look. And then you can also have um, administrative aids and so you can ask questions like are the chunks uh, small enough is there more navigation needed uh, can we shorten the label of the page and you can use things like style guides so style guides should, should tell you how the site is organized why it's organized that way and for who it's organized that way and then you have um, style guides can contain things like standards and guidelines and maintenance and procedures. So who's going to maintain the page? Who's going to add content to the page? Is it going to be the end user? Is it going to be the, the people that run the page? <coughs> and then finally, um, what I wanted to point out is that you can go to this uh, website. And this is uh, Information Architecture Institute. It's iainstitute.org slash tools. And on this page, uh, you can see all, there's all kinds of templates and visual tools that you can use. So you can um, use their example of card sorting when you do the exercise number two, if that's your concern. They have things for brainstorming. Uh, they also have uh, different aids for um, doing site maps. And as I said, blueprints are similar to site maps, but not the same thing. And then they have things like um, um, a lot of different wireframes that you can look at. So there's examples of, of wireframes. So if I look at this one, Uh, this is a low fidelity wireframe. It just shows you how you can uh, set up the information on your site. And as you see, the content is not, it's just like a Latin they put in there. They just put in filler content. So it gives you an idea of the, the formatting and the location of elements and, uh, and how you would link elements, but it doesn't actually put in the content itself. And another example of a wireframe, this is also maybe different types of websites have different types of looks. If it's a service website or if it's an information website, if it's an e-business website. And um, Yeah, these are, all, these are like all low fidelity templates and you can fill them in and make them more detailed. So that's up to you. You can choose one of these designs to use. Um, you might use, you might present it in a PowerPoint. You might present it in um, one of the tools. They have Visio tools, uh, um, documents that you can use. That's for the yeah, you can use it in exercise three, but there's also some other, like there's lots of information resources on this page. Like, so it depends on what you have. There was like something about personas mm -hmm. here. So you can use, you can look at the information that they have for different types of, <coughs> these are like helping, <coughs> helping with visualization. 
Okay, so that's the end of this um, one. Let's see if there was. Um, yeah. <coughs> um, I said I was going to say something about chapter fourteen as well, and they don't. We don't have a. a uh, we don't have a. Um, slide set for chapter 14. <coughs> okay, but um, there is a, a discussion of, of ethics. Chapter 14 is about ethics. And it is a discussion by, uh, about ethics by Peter Morville, which is one of the authors of the book. And that's located on, uh, on the web page This is an underscore. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this comes after this. That's argus-acia.com slash strange underscore connections slash strange 008.html. And it kind of also uh, mentions some of the main issues about ethics. And that is that um, one, you should be uh, careful about your categorization of information. You should try to avoid labels that are undesirable or that can introduce uh, biases. And an example would be like. Um, they, they actually mention in the chapter on page 342, grid versus aids. Another issue is the granularity. So this is the uh, size of the group that you're trying to address in using your, your labels. Uh, you should try to avoid overgeneralization and um, also tr try to avoid being too uh, segmented. <coughs> so you try to <coughs> Um, find that balance in the granularity. Another issue is about access to information. Uh, you should consider um, that uh, the users are different and that there, there's a whole uh, spectrum of people with physical and intellectual abilities or disabilities. And 
this means that like you might have people that for example have difficulty seeing and you might make your um, uh, website with um, large fonts or with sound over or with text over or um, different different types of uh, aids to uh, they might assist people that have that particular uh, disability so um, there are there's the um, the W3C um, there's there's standards for universal access and you can uh, look look for those when you're designing your web page and then there is um, persistence the issue of persistence and that means that um, what we say or do on the web ends up staying there so once it's out there you can't take it back So you can um, change your website and make it nicer and remove maybe information that could have been offending at some point, but you really can never take it back because once it's been out there, it's been cached and it, you can look at services like the Wayback Machine, it's the old versions of websites, people have personal storages and once things are out there, it's out there forever. So whenever you post something, um, for your website, you should also just think about the persistence or the continue, continuous availability of that information for forever. So these are kind of the main ethical issues. That are talked about in chapter 14. And they are also highlighted in this uh, document that's by the author of the book as well. He talks about the same issues on the document. Okay. Okay, so that's basically what I wanted to cover today. We finished chapter 12 and we finished chapter 14. And uh, next week you will be presenting uh, your exercise number two. And, uh, and then we'll set up the groups for exercise number three at the same time next week. So that's it for today. Any questions? Nope.